probably at some point seen one of those optical illusion pictures. They are pictures where most people at first, when they first look at them, they see a particular image. One that most people would see and then upon looking at it more deeply or after somebody points out to you the picture or something else in the picture, then you see something else that you didn't see before. And oftentimes it takes somebody pointing out to you what you didn't previously see for you to see it. I had seen this optical illusion and it was a kind of mirror imaging of what looked like crocodiles. And so you got crocodiles on either side in a kind of mirror image way and their snouts were touching and their jaws at the bottom were not. And when you first look at the picture, you say, okay, it looks like two crocodiles. But then when you see the teeth on the top and the teeth on the bottom in a mirror image way on either side, if somebody points it out to you, unless you see it on your own at first, you could then see right in the middle of the picture, there is an eagle, a silhouette of an eagle. I say that because that's kind of how it can be with Stephen's speech in Acts chapter 7. For some people, when they look at Stephen's speech, Stephen's address in Acts chapter 7, all they see is a kind of history rehearsal. It just seems like he's just talking about history. Is he even answering the charges against him? He's had charges against him. The high priest is asking him, are these things so? And it seems like, to many people, Stephen just begins to kind of meander his way through Jewish history. As a matter of fact, one writer, for instance, said, Stephen is supposed to be answering the question of whether he is guilty of the charges, but a very large part of his speech has no bearing on this at all. So they see Stephen as kind of meandering through history without much reference to the accusations against him. And make no mistake, a history lesson is indeed part of what's happening in Acts chapter 7. But if all you see is a bare rehearsal of history, you've seen the crocodiles, as it were, and you've missed the eagle. The eagle, if you will, is how reference after reference that Stephen gives has bearing both on his defense, if you will, and even more so on the prosecution of his prosecutors. So what I want you to see is that Stephen's response is not a history lesson without an aim. There are themes that tie this together, themes that you're going to see he weaves together by the power of the Holy Spirit so wonderfully. And if you asked, okay, well, what are those themes? Well, I'm glad you asked. I want you to remember the context. The context is Stephen, who we were introduced to in Acts chapter 6. Remember, he was one of the seven. There was a dispute between the Hellenistic um, widows and the Hebraic widows, and there was this debate that the Hellenistic widows were getting overlooked in the daily distribution of food, maybe clothing, maybe some other resources. They were being overlooked, so the apostles didn't overlook that problem. They said, let seven men be chosen, and these seven men had to be of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, and full of wisdom. And Stephen was the first of the seven. So he wasn't only of good reputation, he wasn't only full of the Holy Spirit, and he wasn't only full of wisdom. When we go on in Acts chapter 6, in verse 5, for instance, we're told that he was a man full of faith. He trusted the word of God. He trusted the promises of God. And he was full of the Holy Spirit. We go on a little bit further, and we find out that he was somebody, in verse 8, who was full of grace. The grace of God so mightily worked in him. And he was full of power. He did wonders and signs among the people. That's who this Stephen was. Well, he is apparently talking about Christ, talking about the resurrection, and there are some from the synagogue of the freedmen and maybe from other surrounding places as well. They are there, and they come, and they start debating with Stephen. And I told you last time around, two weeks ago, it seems like Saul of Tarsus was likely one of those people because people from Sicilia uh, were there, and that's where Saul was from. And then we see him holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen a little bit later on in Acts chapter 7. But even Saul, before his conversion, couldn't stand up to the wisdom that Stephen had been given to him by the Holy Spirit. We're told in Acts chapter 6, verse 10, they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. So those who were debating Stephen, all of those people, and I presume Saul was likely among them, they couldn't resist the wisdom with which Stephen spoke. In other words, they couldn't out-debate him. The Holy Spirit gave him such wisdom. And what often happens when people can't win the debate, they begin to attack the debater. 
And so they resorted to other measures. Like, okay, we can't win this debate with him, but maybe we could silence him. We won't have to debate him. We don't have to win the debate. Maybe we'll just silence him. So they accuse him of blasphemy. And you know, according to the old covenant, if you were accused with blasphemy and found out to be guilty of it, you were executed. It was a capital crime. And they threw the kitchen sink at Stephen. If you remember the accusations, and this is important, you would see this in Acts chapter 6, verse 11, and you'd see it in verses 13 and 14. They accused him of blaspheming Moses. They accused him of blaspheming God. They accused him of blaspheming the temple. And they accused him of blaspheming the law. They're basically saying he's blaspheming everything. They wanted to make sure they got him on some charge of blasphemy so that he would be executed. Well, if you know that, if you know what the accusations are, then you'll better understand what to look for in this defense. Because it is marvelous. Stephen's defense and his references are not without intentionality. You're going to see, it's as though he responds to each one of those charges. You're calling me a blasphemer of God? I'll show you I'm not a blasphemer of God. You're calling me a blasphemer of Moses? I'll show you I'm not a blasphemer of Moses. You're calling me a blasphemer of the temple and the law? I'll show you that I'm not a blasphemer of the temple and the law. But then what he does is he not only provides that kind of implicit defense, if you will, but he goes on the offense. See, Stephen wasn't just trying to get off the hook. I think he knew in this moment, I'm a marked man, as one writer put it. They're going to put me to death. And he turns the tables on them, and he begins to prosecute the case against them. He shows them, to use language from one minister, their idolatrous attachment to the temple. You've got this really bad, idolatrous attachment to the temple, and he's going to show them, you're actually walking in the footsteps of your fathers. You, in many ways, you're standing in the shoes of your fathers. The shoes fit indeed very well. And he's going to essentially tell them, this has been your story. And this has been your song. You reject the deliverers that God has sent to you all the day long. You're going to see that as we get into the text. It's amazing. And there's one thing I want you to notice. I'm going to say this at the end. And I'm going to say it on the front end too. I think this passage provides a great opportunity for anyone who reads the Bible and comes to a conclusion like that writer had come to, to second guess your own conclusions. If you think Stephen is just meandering through history, you say, no, 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 no. He was full of the Holy Spirit, and Luke saw fit to have this recorded. Do you know in all of the book of Acts, this is the longest discourse recorded in the book of Acts? And there's a reason for it. And you may read it like that writer and just think, ah, oh, this is just some meandering through history. To use language that Luther used with respect to a six-day creation, he had said, if you can't understand how God could create in six days, then ascribe to the Holy Spirit the honor of being more learned than you. <laughs> and if you can't understand Stephen's tracking through history at first glance or some scripture that you're reading, you want to take a step back and say, you know what, I ascribe to the Holy Spirit the honor of being more learned than me. There's a reason for this. I may not see it at first, but hopefully for you, it'll be like one of those optical illusions. Upon me first reading it at the beginning, kind of just heard maybe history. Now you'll see levels of depth and intentionality. Let's get into the text. We begin in Acts chapter 7, verse 1, where we read, Then the high priest said, Are these things so? Quick context. This is the high priest. This is Caiaphas. The man whose name lives in infamy. One of the ways you know his name lives in infamy. Have you ever met somebody named Caiaphas? <laughs> I haven't. If your name is Caiaphas, I'm not throwing a stone at you. You, you. Your parents just should have thought about that before they named you Caiaphas. But you, you'll see people named, right, Mark or John or Luke and things like that. But this man's name lives in infamy. This is the man who presided over the kangaroo court that would usher Jesus onto his crucifixion. This is the man who's presiding over that Sanhedrin kangaroo court that had looked at the apostles and had saw them fit to be beaten for doing nothing but preaching the resurrection and healing people and so on. And now this man who stood in judgment over the Son of God, who stood in judgment over the apostles, he's now standing in judgment over Stephen. He's heard the accusations against Stephen, and he's essentially asking Stephen, what's your defense? Is it true? 
And imagine the wickedness that probably in his mind at this point, he knows no matter what Stephen says, Stephen's not getting off the hook. But what are your defense? Uh, what is your defense? Are these things so? Now Stephen, he's going to give a response. Let's look at this response. It begins in verse 2. And he said, brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. There's a lot going on here. Okay, so first just note this, the obvious. Note the respect that he's showing. He's showing respect, brethren. So there's a sense of commonality. These were his kinsmen according to the flesh. They were fellow Jews. So he's referencing a sense of commonality, brethren, and then he's even showing respect to the Sanhedrin, fathers, a term of respect. But then watch what he does after that. So that's the first thing I want you to notice. The second thing is, look what he calls God. He calls God the God of glory. Doesn't really sound like a blasphemer of God, does he? He's using Psalm 29, verse 3 language right there. He's using language that David used when he was carried along by the Holy Spirit. In Psalm 29, I'm going to read to you verses 1 through 4, you're going to see this identification for God used. David wrote, Give unto Yahweh, O you mighty ones, give unto Yahweh glory and strength. Give unto Yahweh the glory due to his name. Worship Yahweh in the beauty of holiness. The voice of Yahweh is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. He says, Yahweh is over many waters. The voice of Yahweh is powerful. The voice of Yahweh is full of majesty. So Stephen, at the beginning of his defense, he's referencing Yahweh, the God of Israel, as being the God of glory. Now, as an Old Testament Jew, they'd have in view Shekinah glory. What does that mean? It just means manifested, outward, revealed glory. God has actually shown himself. He's revealed how glorious he is, at least to a degree that fallen, created beings can see. He is the God of glory. In other words, he's also implying that God is worthy of praise and honor because he is glorious. So what is he saying here? I'm not against the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm not against Israel. He even says the God of glory appeared to who? To our father Abraham. He's basically saying, I embrace my Jewish heritage. But then watch what he says. Look at this. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. One of the big issues that the Jewish religious leadership had with Stephen is that he talked against the temple. Because he said that the temple was going to be destroyed. And for them, that was sacrilegious. You dare not speak against the temple. This is part of their history. I'll show you again in a minute. But notice what Stephen's doing here. He is reminding them that this whole story of the Jewish people didn't begin with a temple. It didn't even begin in the promised land. It began in pagan lands, in Mesopotamia. That's where the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. So implicitly, right off the bat, he's showing them I'm not a blasphemer of God. I am a fellow Jew, and I want to remind you right from the beginning that God was not so tethered to a specific locale that he couldn't reveal himself to our father Abraham in a pagan land. That's where the God of glory appeared to him. Amazing. See, the Jews would just associate, at least some of them anyway, uh, the per ones who would persecute him, they would associate glory with the temple, glory with the temple, as though Yahweh was limited to a specific locale. Now, this was a problem. In the history of the Jewish people, as Stephen's going to remind them, they had a big problem of rejecting those that God sent to them, but they also had a problem of treating certain things or certain places like a kind of lucky rabbit's foot. Before I was a Christian, for a little while, I carried around a lucky rabbit's foot. It kind of grossed me out. I don't think it was necessarily a real one, but like me, you probably had some things that you carried around and you thought, this thing, if I carry around this thing, good things will come my way. Good things will happen to me and so on. Well, the Jewish people in their history did that sometimes with sacred things. So they were living in rebellion against God. In 1 Samuel 4, they're about to go up to battle with the Philistines. 
And they say, I know what we're going to do. Even though we're living in rebellion against God, let's bring out the Ark of the Covenant. And so they bring out the Ark of the Covenant. The people celebrate. The cheering is so loud that the Philistines hear it from far off. And they're even shaken up a little bit at first. And you know what happens? Israel gets routed. And thousands of Israelites die. They held on to the ark like a lucky rabbit's foot, thinking that the ark was going to be what delivered them. A little bit later on in Israel's history, you might remember, Jeremiah was prophesying to the people of Judah, saying, the Babylonians are coming. This land is going to be sacked. And he reprimanded the people of Judah because they would have this thing. You see it in Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 4. They would say this little phrase over and over again. The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. The idea was they're like, the temple's here. If the temple is here, we are unstoppable because there's no way Yahweh would allow his temple to be destroyed. Even though if you look in Jeremiah 7, they practice murder, they practice all kinds of different abominations and injustice, but they thought since they had the temple there, they were safe. And I think in many ways, the Jews of Stephen's day were just like that. There's no way this temple is going to be destroyed, even though Jesus promised that it would be, and indeed it was in 70 AD. Let me just remind you, this is just a quick little aside here. Please do not hold on to certain things or places as though they are kind of lucky rabbit's feet. Right? You want to hold on to the word of God and the promises of God. That's what you want to hold on to. Should you love coming to this place? Of course you should. Because God has commanded his people not to forsake the, the assembling of themselves. We are to gather and to gather all the more as we see the day of Christ approaching. Hebrews 10 verses 24 and 25. But you don't want to have some sort of rabbit foot theology. Where whether it's a certain place or a certain thing you're carrying. As though that brings you closer to God. Before I knew Christ, I had that kind of thing happen in my life all kinds of, in all kinds of ways. I want you to be somebody who understands that, no, no, I am trusting the word of God and the living God is in me. I don't need some sort of medallion, some sort of talisman to bring about his presence. Through the gospel, his presence is inside of me and he's with me. Well, here Stephen begins by reminding them, story began in the pagan land. It didn't begin in the land of Canaan. One other quick aside. Just to remind you of this, because you see it right here, be reminded of the doctrine of sovereign and free grace. Why did God choose Abraham? Because he did. It was according to his free and sovereign grace. Did Abraham earn it or deserve it? No. He was a pagan man living in a pagan land. But sovereign grace found him. Was it according to his willing or running, to use language from Romans 9? No. It was sovereign grace. Told you, once you see it, See it everywhere. Um, now look how Stephen continues, verses 3 and 4. And said to him, so Stephen's continuing, he said, This is what God said to Abraham, then Abram, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and he dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. Now, if you were to think about uh, when God's calling to Abraham happened, scripturally, like in what chapter of scripture, many of you would know, oh, Genesis 12. In Genesis 12, like the opening verses there. And you're right to think that. But what Stephen is showing you here is that the call that came to Abraham actually preceded his time in Haran. Abraham was in Haran in Genesis 12. A little bit of history here. The call that came to Abraham even preceded that when Abraham was in Mesopotamia, in Ur of the Chaldeans. So you learn that from what Stephen is saying right here. So Abraham left Ur of the Chaldeans and he dwelt in Haran. We see this in Genesis 11, verse 31. And he dwelt there until his father, whose name was Terah, died. When his father died, God moved him to the land of Canaan couple quick points here, just to follow with what, what I think Stephen is doing. Again, Stephen does not sound like a blasphemer, does he? Doesn't sound like a blasphemer. He's referencing God's call to Abraham. He's referencing the Abrahamic covenant that God made with Abraham, as referenced in Genesis 12, beginning at verse 1. 
Stephen's quoting the beginning of it. He affirms that God is the one who called Abraham while he was in Mesopotamia, and he brought him from Haran to Canaan. Again, he's establishing, I'm not anti-God, I'm not anti-Israel. Second point I want you to see is maybe this is what's going on too. Maybe, I don't know, I can't say it for certain. Maybe he's reminding them that God was honored and obeyed by Abraham when he was in a foreign land and without a temple. You could actually be obedient to God and not be in what uh, one minister called sacred space. As a matter of fact, we're called to be obedient to God wherever we are. And Abraham was an example of that. And by way of application for everybody in this room, just a quick bit of application. Notice that Abraham was called to walk by faith. This was not an easy walk. He was called to leave behind his pagan land and his family and essentially to commit all to Yahweh, to God, and to trust him and to do what God told him to do and to go where God has called him to go. And I just want to remind you, isn't that analogous to the Christian life that you've been called to as a New Testament believer? When you come to Christ, you are called to leave your old life behind and live out your new life in Christ. To use language from John Gill, you are called to leave your former course of life and your former companions and follow Christ, be joined to his church, and be on the road to a better country, a heavenly country. Is it easy? No, it's not easy. Can it be very painful? I could tell you by experience. It could be very painful. Yes, it can. But it's part of the calling. Imagine if you were living in the days of Judea and Jesus came to your town and said like he said to the apostles, come follow me. It's like all of a sudden your life got radically transformed. You were on a new path. You were following the Lord Jesus Christ. And you could still love people and you could still be an ambassador of kindness to people. But you had a new priority that was directing your life. It was the Son of God who was changing your priorities and your whole life then revolved around him. And a quick reminder what New Testament biblical Christianity actually looks like is it looks like that. You have more in common with Abraham than you think. There was a radical call to Abraham, leave it all behind and come follow me. And there's a sense in which that's part of the gospel call for you. It's as though Jesus becomes so consuming. And do you still love others? Do you still, uh, are you an ambassador of kindness within your family and so on? Of course you are. But you have this new priority that is radically reorienting your life. And it's being in love with the son of God who gave his life for you and seeing him as your Lord. Well, Abraham, um, he goes to the land in which God had called him to go. There's more to Abraham's story. Watch how Stephen continues in verse 5. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. Why is Stephen saying this? I'll tell you what I think part of it is. He's telling his Jewish hearers He's reminding them of a little history they might have forgotten. God didn't even let Abraham inherit the promised land. Not even, look at the language there in verse 5, not even enough to set his foot on. Abraham, outside like a plot of burial land that he bought, didn't inherit any of the land as his own. But what did Abraham have? He didn't have a place, but he had a promise. He had the promise of God. And I think this is going to be a drum that Stephen beats over and over again. It's as if Stephen is saying specific locales and land, as important as they may be, are not what you and our fathers have often made them to be. You make places the main thing when faith in God's promises and obedience to God's word, that's the main thing. That's the outworking of a life in Christ. And that's not working even in the Old Testament of a life of following Yahweh. Stephen continues in verses 6 and 7, and he says, But God spoke this way, that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land, and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage, that was Egypt, I will judge, execute judgment, i.e. punish, said God, and after that they shall come out and serve me in this place. A couple things here, track with what Stephen's doing. Again, Stephen is not a blasphemer of God. He is glorifying God for God's omniscience, God's predictive power. God is the one who predicted that Abraham's descendants would dwell in a foreign land. He's not a blasphemer of God. He's ascribing to God omniscience. God predicts the future. 
He's also ascribing to God omnipotence because God single-handedly judged Egypt. Egypt was the superpower of the day. And God, in his great power, judged Egypt by levying plague upon plague of the ten plagues upon Egypt and then having the Red Sea close upon Pharaoh and his army. He's not a blasphemer of God. Not at all. God judged the nation that oppressed his people. And interestingly, God would judge the nation of Israel in 70 A.D. rather mightily even as the nation of Israel was on the forefront of persecuting the people of God, persecuting Christians. Interesting. God spoke in this way. Look at verse 6. That his descendants would dwell in the foreign land. It's as though Stephen is telling them, Yahweh brought Abraham to the land of Canaan, and Abraham didn't get to inherit the land of Canaan. And as a matter of fact... God was so not tethered to this land that the descendants of Abraham wouldn't even be in this land for hundreds of years. I think that's part of what's going on here as well. 400, maybe a rounded off number because we see in other places the number 430. And then Stephen, he's kind of combining a quote from Genesis 15, 16 and perfectly tethering to that words from Exodus 3, 12. And after that, they shall come out and serve me in this place. Quick note here. Why does God set his people free? Among the reasons why he sets his people free is so that his people might serve him. Like if you've actually come to know the gospel, if you actually love the Lord Jesus Christ, and you say, wow, God so loved me that he sent his son to die for me. If you've seen that, and you've been set free from your sins, set free from the judgment to come, part of the reason why God did that is so that you might serve Him. I mean, this is New Testament uh, language as well. 1 Thessalonians chapter, nine, uh, chapter 1, beginning at the second half of verse 9 into verse 10, Paul told those Thessalonians that they were those who turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Oh, it's such a picture of what saving faith looks like. You're delivered from bondage to idols. You turn from them. That's repentance. I used to live this way. I don't live that way anymore. I used to be in bondage to idolatry. By God's grace, I've been set free from slavery to sin and slavery to self. And I have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I wait for the Son of God to be revealed from heaven. Now track with this, he's going to shift ideas in a moment, but a little bit more here. And this might seem like it comes out of nowhere, but again, I don't think it does. Look at verse 8. Then he gave him, talking about Abraham, the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs. Again, he's not a blasphemer. He's not blaspheming the law. He's referencing circumcision. He's even aware of the lingo. Lingo that they would appreciate. He uses the language, the covenant of circumcision. Which God had given to Abraham. And Abraham, according to God's command, circumcised Isaac on the eighth day. I think he's also setting up a contrast. Not to give away the story, but later on, he's going to call his hearers who are looking to kill him uncircumcised. They were uncircumcised in heart. You have the outward stuff down, guys. I mean, you love the temple. You got the outward stuff down. Circumcision, I mean, you've really embraced that, but you've missed the whole point. You're uncircumcised in heart. You may have the outward, external, ceremonial, physical, fleshly stuff down, but what about the heart stuff? And he's setting that up, I think, right now. He's showing them, I'm not a blasphemer. I appreciate this covenant. But you guys have missed the point of the covenant. It wasn't about outward things ultimately. It was about a work that God was going to do inwardly. And you guys are uncircumcised in your heart. You've still got that old fallen flesh all over your heart. You haven't been circumcised in heart. You haven't been given a new heart. I think he's setting that up right here. I think part of what he's saying too is, look, the patriarchs, they didn't have a temple. They didn't have a land. 
Look at Hebrews 11. They were all like wanderers looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. And yet, he would be telling his hearers implicitly, but we love them. We respect them. That's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they managed to obey God and be examples of faith in many ways without being tethered to a temple that they didn't have or a law that hadn't been given at Sinai yet. Oh, he's saying a lot here. But you notice how he's doing it in such a way. He's doing it in such a way where he's recalling the history. He's showing common ground. They will listen to him. and like, okay, he's speaking our language. He's speaking our history. But there are all these implicit points along the way. Some things are going to get a little bit more explicit. So he references the 12 tribes of Israel. Watch this transition. I love this here. You're going to love this. If you're not familiar with some Old Testament narratives, uh, this should whet your appetite to become more familiar with them. Especially what I'm about to reference to you. Look at verses... 9 and 10. And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and made him governor over Egypt and all his house. So he referenced the patriarchs in verse 8 to set up this transition in verse 9. And you're like, well, why is, he, why is he talking about Joseph now? Oh, he's talking about Joseph because he wants to remind them not only of Joseph, but he wants to remind them of the patriarchs. Do you remember what happened with Joseph and the patriarchs? He's essentially telling his prosecutors. They envied Joseph. And because they envied Joseph, what did they do? They handed Joseph over to foreigners, to Ishmaelites. They sold him for 20 pieces of silver. And isn't it interesting that we're told in Matthew 27, verse 18, and Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 15, verse 10, that Pilate knew that the chief priest had handed over Jesus because of envy. They were more like the patriarchs than they realized. They had this pattern of rejecting the deliverers that God would send to them. He's going to make this point over and over again. And look at the parallels there. Joseph has the 12 patriarchs, or the 11 patriarchs, besides Joseph, Joseph being one of them, he has his brethren reject him. Benjamin, not included in what happened, but he has the patriarchs reject him and sell him into the hands of foreigners. And then you have the Sanhedrin, the chief priests, who essentially stood in the shoes and the sandals of the patriarchs, and they sold Jesus, as it were, into the hands of foreigners, into the hands of Gentiles, into the hands of the Romans. So the sons of Jacob united to get rid of Joseph, and in like manner, to use language from one commentator, the children of Israel united to get rid of Jesus. There's another takeaway here. Watch this. This is masterful. Although Joseph was sold into Egypt, God was with him. So he was rejected by the patriarchs, but yet God was with him. Christ was rejected by the chief priests, but to use language from Acts chapter 10, verse 38, God was with him. And of course, he was God. This is amazing. Also, watch how the themes all weave together. God was with Joseph. Where was Joseph? Was he in the land of Canaan? Nope. God was with him. Where was he? In Egypt. In Egypt. I would imagine that the hearers, the Sanhedrin, didn't like all these references being pointed to them. He, Egypt didn't have good connotations. You know, they weren't like, oh, we love Egypt. Egypt was a place of bondage. Egypt was a place associated with idolatry. Oh, but there's more. There's more. Look at verse 10. What did God do for Joseph? God delivered him out of all of his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Look at the parallels here. So Joseph is in Pharaoh's court, but then he is granted favor, delivered out of his troubles. And where is he raised to? He's raised, as it were, to the right hand of Pharaoh. So much so that Pharaoh puts Joseph on a chariot and when the chariot goes through the, the, the places in the city, the cry would go out, bow the knee. God delivered Joseph out of his troubles and raised him to a place of prominence. Remind you of a savior who was delivered from the grave and who was raised to the right hand of the father. And he is the one 
to whom every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Stephen is saying a lot here. This isn't just a meandering through history. He's setting up where he's going to reference Christ at the end. It's as though he's painting pictures of Christ as he goes through. And he's also showing them how they stand in the sandals of the patriarchs. Look at verses 11 and 12. Now a famine and great affliction, or trouble, came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers first. Okay, so famine comes to Egypt, just like Joseph predicted that it would. You see this in Genesis 41. You could look at verse 54 specifically. The destruction of Jerusalem would also come, just like Jesus said it would. That would come in 70 A.D. The one that they rejected was their means of deliverance. That's interesting to note. They rejected Joseph, but Joseph was the only way out, you might say. And I want you to see here, where does Jacob, one of the patriarchs, send his sons? Out of the promised land to Egypt. See, this isn't meandering. It isn't, it's all connected here. He's showing them that their idolatrous attachment to the temple, the way that they viewed specific locales, had a problem and didn't really line up with the history of the Jewish people. Now, if you remember the story of Joseph, I want to ask you something. The first time, because it's implied here, right here in verses um, 11 and 12, when Joseph sees his brothers when Jacob first sends them to him. Benjamin's not there. Do the brothers recognize Joseph the first time? No. no. Look at verse 13. And the second time, Joseph was made known to his brothers. And Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. My opinion? I think the parallels run pretty deep here. That at Jesus' first coming, he came to his own, and his own didn't recognize him, by and large. But when he comes again, if you look at Zechariah chapter 12, verses 10 through 14, if you look at Jesus' words, what he said to Jerusalem, to the people of Israel, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And there is coming a day when the spirit of grace and supplication will be poured out upon Judah and Jerusalem. And at that second coming, when Jesus comes, their hearts will be pierced. They will look upon him whom they pierce and they will mourn for him and they will see he is the Messiah. He is the promised one. That second time, even as Joseph revealed himself to his brothers that second time around, I think it's paradigmatic with what will happen with the nation of Israel that that remnant in Israel will come to Christ, particularly at his return. Look at verses 14 and 15. Look who else moved out of the promised land. Then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all of his relatives, 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers. So they all moved to Egypt. They all moved. Even Jacob went to Egypt. They were not in the right specific religious locale. And yet God was working mightily. And God is setting up one of the greatest moments in redemption history that would come via their departure from Egypt. God was working it all together for their good. And notice, again to remind you, Joseph who was rejected was the one who would be their deliverer. I wish we can go through it all today. We're not. But this is the pattern you're going to see. Not to give away the story. We'll see when we get there. What happened with Moses? Was Moses like immediately embraced by the Jewish people? No. What about Jeremiah? What about the prophets? Were they all embraced immediately by the Jewish people? No. And this is part of what Stephen's telling them. You have a history. I have a history. He's essentially telling them our fathers have this pattern of rejecting the ones that God sends to them. Look at verse 16. And they were carried back to Shechem, Shechem, and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. Abraham appears to have bought this land, and they were out of the land for a while, and Jacob 
uh, appears to have to had um, buy it himself as well. And we see that in Joshua 24, verse 32. But here's one other point I want to make for you before I get ready to close, and it's this. To use language from Thomas Constable, in Stephen's day, Shechem was in Samaritan territory. He reminded the Sanhedrin that their ancestral deliverer was buried in the land that Orthodox Jews despised and avoided. This was another instance of helping them see that they should not think that the only place God worked was in the promised land. So a few takeaways as I get ready to close. We're stopping right now in, in the middle, as it were, or towards the front half of Stephen's defense. So there's a lot more, but I hope that some of these takeaways will be helpful for you. And the first one I want to say is this. Please know, whenever you read the scriptures, God's word always has infinite wisdom behind what's written. I hope this is an illustration of that for you. That at first glance you're like, ah, oh, it just seems like history. Like, no, 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 no. There's a lot happening. He's replying indirectly to the accusations against him, and he's setting up a case of prosecuting them, and it's going to climax with his reference of them rejecting the just one, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what this is all leading up to. And it's so smart. He's carried along by the Holy Spirit. He's full of the Holy Spirit. And his hearers are listening to it. He's speaking their language and indirectly teaching them a whole bunch of things they should have already known. So what's my takeaway for you and I? If you're reading something, you're reading Leviticus, you're reading some of the genealogies and chronicles, you're reading some of the lists and numbers, and you're like, I don't understand what this is all about. Uh, fair enough. Ascribe to the Holy Spirit the honor of being more learned than you. And know that behind what you're reading is infinite wisdom. And immediately what happens? You are humbled and God is exalted. Like humility can happen right there. Like via genealogy that you don't understand why it's there in Chronicles. Like why are all these lists in Chronicles, for instance, right? Immediately you can grow in grace by saying, I humble myself. Because I know behind this is infinite wisdom. Oh, how healthy that is for you and I spiritually. Second thing, by way of application, I want to say is this. I want to say, know your history. I'm talking about biblical history specifically. Look at Stephen. He doesn't have any notes. He's just going. He's carried along by the Holy Spirit. God had given him a mouth that his detractors could not resist, and God is leading him in this moment. But he knew his history. So let me give you a little bit of pastoral counsel. You say, well, how can I do that? You expect me, George, to just start in Genesis 1 and I'm going to memorize the whole Bible? No, no, no. I'm not telling you to do that. You can do that. Go for it if you want. I mean, that's, that's really cool. Um, but I would tell you to do this. Maybe something you do, right? Start in Genesis, right? And maybe you could do this with another brother or sister in Christ. You could do this with somebody in your family. Like a husband, you could do it with your wife. Wife, you could do it with your husband. Parents, you could do it with kids. You could, this is really fun and it's going to help you learn biblical history. Start with Genesis 1. And see if you could just go through Genesis 1 as far as you can and give a little summary of what's in the chapter. Genesis 1. Well, that's a creation account. We see the days of creation right there in Genesis 1. Well, in Genesis 2, that's when we see God, how he formed Adam from the dust of the ground, and how he made Eve from a rib in Adam's side, and how he brought Eve to Adam. Well, Genesis 3. Genesis 3 is when the fall happens. We remember the tone changes, and that's when the fall happens, and that's when the curse upon the serpent is pronounced, and the first proclamation of the gospel comes. Uh, Genesis 4. That's the account of Cain and Abel. See, what you, and you just keep doing that. Genesis 5, there's the genealogy of Adam. Genesis 6, we hear about the turmoil on earth, and this is the beginning of the story of Noah and the, and the flood when it comes. So what you can do, you could do this with another brother or sister in Christ. You could do this in your own home. You could do it with whoever. You could do it by yourself. See how far you could go. And when you don't know, like, I don't know what happened in Genesis 25. We'll find out. And then you grow in knowing your history. That's one way of doing it. So I pass that on to you as a great way to start learning biblical history. Third point, takeaway is simple. Trust God's promises and obey God's word. The Christian life in many ways, you are not saved by works, you're saved by grace alone through faith alone. But really that old hymn summarized the Christian life very well. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. It comes down to that. Trusting God's word and obeying God's word. And finally, last point, 
I can't help but think of this when seeing the Sanhedrin right there. They knew their history. Stephen knew his history. They knew their history. But even though they knew their history, they didn't really know their history as they ought to have. And so much of what Stephen was saying was right in front of them. Some of you, if you don't wear glasses, you might not be familiar with this illustration I'm about to give you. But for those of you who wear glasses, you've had one of those moments like I've had more times than I care to remember when I'm like, where are my glasses? Where are my glasses? And where are they? They're right on my face. <laughs> like, they're, they're right there. Right there. Where are the keys? You're like, you're holding them. Oh, man. Oh, man. I hope I'm okay. I hope I'm okay. <laughs> we, we have that tendency to kind of miss what could be right in front of us. And they were doing that. And so I just close today because I don't want anybody in this place to miss what's right in front of you. What's right in front of you is the greatest demonstration of love that could ever be imagined beyond what we could imagine in the gospel. God sending his son. It's right here in front of you. It's proclaimed from this pulpit. It's proclaimed in the announcements. It's proclaimed in song. Don't miss what's right in front of you. Don't, don't say, like, I, I, how do I get to heaven? How can I know that I'm forgiven? How can I know I have peace with God? It's like the glasses are right there on you. His name is Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And God in His great love sent His Son to absorb the punishment that we deserve. God hates sin more than we can imagine. You all know that. I've talked to you about the doctrine of hell. The doctrine of hell is a reminder that God is holy and our sin is more heinous than we can imagine. But the doctrine of hell should remind you of the greatness of God's love because He poured out that kind of wrath that we deserve on His Son. So I plead with everybody in this room, don't miss the good news that's right in front of you. Week after week in this pulpit, that Jesus Christ died for sinners. So if you see yourself as a sinner, that's a great start. If you see yourself in need of a Savior, that's also a great start. But you have to, by the grace of God, cross that finish line and see Jesus as that Savior who died for your sins and rose from the grave. Praise God. There's more to see. This is an amazing account, isn't it? More to see. and I can't wait to get to it. Lord willing, we will next week. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your son and our savior. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit and the way in which he so empowered Stephen to speak in ways that would so bring glory to you and edification to us. Father, we do pray that you would help us to have the takeaways that we ought to have, that we might treasure your word, trust your promises, Obey your commandments by your grace. Revel in the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, help us. Help us to appreciate the history that is in the Scriptures and the myriad of ways in which it gloriously points to Christ and how we ought to live the Christian life. Thank you for the one who was delivered from the trouble of death and the grave. Delivered so he might deliver us. Thank you for our Savior who has been exalted to your right hand. And thank you that through your grace he's been revealed to us. May we treasure him afresh even this day, even as we seek to humble ourselves before your word and extol and exalt your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>